I'm, I'm delighted to be back at the University of Virginia 25 years after the 50th anniversary conference. I assume there'll be a 100th anniversary conference if the SEC survives, and I'm looking forward to that one too. My association with the SEC goes way back. As the dean told you, in the 1970s, I was in the Solicitor General's office, uh, and I helped the SEC lose some very prominent cases, including blue chip stamps and Chiarella. I'm sure the SEC could have lost those cases on its own, but it was fun to have participated along the way. As, as the dean mentioned, 25 years ago at the last conference on the anniversary of the SEC, Dan Fischel and I presented a paper about mandatory disclosure. We concluded that compulsory disclosure could help solve a free rider problem that might lead each firm on its own to say too little. Because from society's perspective, what really matters is comparative information. But each firm would be inclined not to help investors with information that could compare it to other firms, in part because the benefits of that disclosure leak. That is, they're enjoyed by the investors in other firms. And in the interest of each firm, they might want to keep that uh, confidential. Now, whether the benefits of mandatory disclosure exceed the cost was and remains an open question. Likewise, it's questionable whether reciprocity could be achieved when firms could choose to go private but at least there was potential for gain. Fischel and I assumed, as did others during the 50th anniversary conference, that all important details about what firms did with the money they raised would be governed by state law. The benefits of reciprocal disclosure were national, but the benefits of firm governance were internalized to the investors in each firm. Now, that assumption uh, that state law and the Articles of Incorporation controlled uh, would have been controversial uh, at the SEC's outset, but by 1984 it was common ground among students of corporate and securities law. Why it was controversial in the 30s and the 60s, settled in the 80s, and controversial again today, is my topic. I chose the subject and title of this talk in homage to Ralph Winter's paper published almost exactly 30 years ago entitled State Law, Shareholder Protection, and the Theory of the Corporation. It's the single most important contribution to the economic analysis of corporate law since Ronald Coase published The Theory of the Firm in 1937. Only the roughly contemporaneous paper by Jensen and Meckling about agency cost and the theory of the firm is a serious rival to Winter's. To understand why Winter was worried about a race to the bottom and why I'm worried about that today, I want to take you back to the 1970s. When Ralph Winter was a professor at Yale, he didn't turn into a federal judge until 1981. The dominant academic view in the 1970s was that Delaware had waged and won a race for the bottom in corporate law by offering ever more favorable terms to managers who then move their corporation to that jurisdiction. William Carey, who was chairman of the SEC from 1961 to 1964, wrote the most famous denunciation. But Stanley Kaplan, from whom I took corporate law at the University of Chicago, held the same view. When the faculty of the University of Chicago teaches that markets are bad, and that only federal regulation can save the day, as Kaplan did, you can be confident there was an economic consensus. There was an academic consensus, sorry. And it's a very simple tale to tell. Naturally, managers want the most discretion, the better to steal from investors. Naturally, states compete to offer that discretion, the better to increase their franchise fees. Burley and Means told us way back about the time the SEC was created that managers are concentrated and strong while investors are scattered and weak. The separation of ownership and control, which allows firms to accumulate vast sums from thousands of people, left the investors powerless. Each, investor, each investor's stake is too small to have any influence either directly or through elections. Indeed, 
None of the scattered investors should study the firm with care because their votes can't affect the outcome of the election. And therefore, all investors are rationally ignorant and rationally passive. And therefore, managers can do what they want. And what they want is to appropriate investors' wealth to the extent they can get away with it. So the professors and political reformers clamored for stringent federal regulation. Instead of letting managers decide, the national government should step in because states had not done so. That led to calls for national chartering, or at least national standards of governance built on the national standards of disclosure from the Securities Acts of 1933 and 34. And if the states were the villains of this piece, the national government was to be the knight in shining armor. What Judge Winter asked was, how could everybody be so stupid? If managers can exploit scattered investors by locating in Delaware, everybody had to know it. And know it long before Kerry wrote his famous article. Why would investors be patsies? Most investors are savvy. Over the long run, ignorant investors lose their stakes to smart ones. So at any given time, the people who control the largest sums and most affect stock prices are also the most sophisticated. They know everything professors know, and then some. If managers divert returns to inv from investors, professional money managers and other big investors should put their money elsewhere or demand compensation ex ante. Now think about this from the manager's perspective or an entrepreneur's perspective. They have to persuade the people with the money to give it to them so they can manage uh, the firm. So managers, in order to do that, have to make credible promises. If managers set up governance structures that allow themselves to skim, how do investors respond? They respond by paying less at the outset until the promised returns rise in relation to the investment to the competitive level. In that way, entrepreneurs have to pay ex ante for the right to exploit investors ex post. If entrepreneurs want to raise more capital, they have to make promises that investors find satisfactory. And when we observe uh, that the investors funnel their money toward firms located in states that allow the most discretion, then they're telling us that those devices cost more uh, than the benefits they deliver to investors. Corporate law in the United States came to be enabling rather than directory precisely because that serves investors' interests, <clears throat> not because it serves managers' interest. States that adopt inefficient regulation propel capital out of their jurisdictions. That's what happened, by the way, when Woodrow Wilson became governor of New Jersey, the original Delaware, concluded that it should be directory rather than enabling. What happened was that all the corporations left. They went to Delaware. Uh, that, that easily can happen again. Entrepreneurs, together with managers, choose where to incorporate, and investors then choose how much to chip in. If managers pick a bad jurisdiction that allows them to exploit, the investors go elsewhere. And notice what drives this engine. This is the, the central point of Judge Winter's paper. What drives the engine is ease of movement within the large United States market, plus the internal affairs doctrine which means that corporations in Delaware have their internal affairs, that other states will recognize the ability of Delaware to regulate the internal affairs. Now, that vital doctrine restricts states' ability to discriminate against corporations that have their place of business or headquarters in other states. Firms in the United States, in other words, can move their charters without moving their productive operations quite unlike the real seat doctrine in Europe, which was created by France in the 19th century to block competition from England. Uh, and as it happened, Delaware was small enough to make a credible commitment. It, approximately 25% uh, of its state budget comes from corporate charter fees, and that's a bond of good faith toward investors who lack votes in the state legislature. Delaware enforces a very strong fiduciary duty of loyalty, but allows firms to select freely among institutions of governance. It's a sidelight, by the way, that the European Union now has got rid of the real seat doctrine, so we can expect more competition there, 
until we know how the Europeans uh, will deal with choice of law issues, that competition uh, will still be hindered. Competition among jurisdictions is going to be insufficient by itself to drive a strong competitive engine. There are, after all, only 50 states, most of which use a single model code drafted by the ABA. For jurisdictional competition to work, there really need to be thousands of competing polities. Uh, but firms can create more by using enabling statutes to create different models of corporate governance. And of course, there are other forms of competition beyond just the number of states. Financial markets are certainly one. Entrepreneurs have to compensate investors ex ante for inefficient rules. As long as at least one state offers an enabling model in which entrepreneurs can choose freely among governance devices, competition to raise capital will drive management strongly toward efficiency. The process operates not only with large firms, uh, which form in public or go public through venture capital, uh, but it can happen all the time. Investors insist that firms distribute money. And I'm thinking not just of dividends, but the fact that most firms are simultaneously taking credit and paying down old credit. Firms are in the, mon the market for money all the time, so the value of their governance devices is continually being priced. Firms, if you have bad internal management, in other words, and you're always in the market for money, you're going to have to pay more, a higher rate of return on money than other firms. And firms that do that are at a competitive disadvantage in a second market, the market for their products. Now, to have money to appropriate from investors, managers must first make profits. But they can't do that if their rivals have a lower cost of capital. So to be in a position to appropriate, managers have to make credible promises not to appropriate. Doesn't competition work wonders? Adam Smith might say, it's almost as if there were an invisible hand. And of course, there are still more markets around. Think of the market for corporate control. Uh, if one firm is poorly managed and investors there don't receive the highest return on their money, that'll depress the price of shares. Someone else can buy up the shares, improve the management, and sell the firm at a profit. I've sometimes suggested that the University of Chicago do that with Harvard, but the, unfortunately, unfortunately, the lack of traded stock in Harvard University uh, impedes that device. But for business corporations, uh, the market in corporate control provides a good deal of power. And in all of this, there are no third-party effects. Competition and contracts promote efficiency to the extent that the contracting parties bear the gains and losses. In corporate finance, that condition is satisfied. Strangers to the governance bargain, such as debt investors and labor, arrange their own affairs by their own contracts. With all costs borne by the participants, free contracting in a competitive system just has to promote everyone's welfare. Well, that was Judge Winter's conclusion. He wrote at a moment when it was becoming possible to test propositions about the way in which financial and corporate markets work. Data about stock prices were being compiled at Chicago for the Center for Research and Securities Prices. Computers were becoming cheaper. Statistical software was coming to market. Soon it was possible to conduct what became known as event studies. You look at how events in the lives of corporations or corporate law affect securities prices. Filter out unrelated events, including changes in the general economy, and there's a method for doing that called the capital asset pricing model. You can isolate the effect of the event you care about with savvy investors. All of the value of those events is going to show up in one way or another in securities prices. Not perfectly. There's a lot of noise in the world and a good deal of irrationality, but about as well as one could expect. And so you can test the value of those events by looking at what happens in securities prices. And of course, there are an awful lot of people seeking out PhDs in finance, and every one of them wanted to do one or more of these studies in order to get them. So study after study tested the winter hypothesis 
that more discretion enables managers to design corporate governance devices that investors welcome. When firms reincorporate in Delaware, stock price rises. When firms get rid of classified boards, stock price rises. And when they stagger directors' terms, prices fall. When states or firms impede the market in corporate control by adopting poison pills, prices fall. I mean, the list goes on and on. There are and always will be debates about just how strong these effects are and just what we make of the exceptions. But as Everett Dirksen would have put it, a few percent here and a few percent there in a trillion dollar economy, sooner or later it adds up to real money. There is a race, and Judge Winter concluded that investors are winning. And now we come to the heart of my topic today and why the title is phrased the way it is. Are we still in a race for the top, or has the direction been reversed? When Judge Winter wrote in 1977, when I was here at the 50th anniversary conference in 1983, the national government played little role in corporate governance. The Securities Exchange Act of 1934 established voting procedures for corporate elections, but those elections themselves were all but irrelevant for reasons I have already given. The Williams Act of 1968 set some rules for tender offers and thus diminished the force of the market for corporate control, but as the takeover boom in the 1970s and 1980s demonstrated, there was still plenty of force in that monitoring mechanism. And then there were, of course, the federal disclosure rules themselves, which are costly and have doubtful net benefits. Dean Mahoney has shown that the benefits of disclosure had largely been achieved by contract before Congress acted in 1933. There was little left for legislation to add unless Congress were to require disclosure even by firms that have no publicly traded stock. But given competition, however that debate comes out, the 1933 Act was unlikely to do any serious harm. But since Judge Winter published his article, and since the 50th anniversary symposium, the national government has done considerably more. The SEC has added rules to the Williams Act, and many of these, such as rules forbidding the warehousing of stock, the secret formation of acquiring groups, and short tenders, have gone far to hamper the market in corporate control. Tax doctrine has been used to make many takeover strategies unprofitable and hinder many devices used to align managers' financial interests with those of investors. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act has specified many governance devices that all traded firms must employ. And very recently, the SEC greatly limited short sales, as if it should be deemed a bad thing for trading markets to fall as well as to rise. I had always thought that the premise of the 1933 and 34 Act was the desirability of accurate prices in markets, and accuracy can be improved when markets go down as well as when markets go up. These national rules are not defaults, which investors may supersede by contract when they deem that in their own interest. They are prescriptions, and prescriptions knock out not only jurisdictional competition, but also several of the competitive devices in financial markets that I've mentioned. If entrepreneurs and managers, by law, cannot offer different devices, then they're not penalized relative to their rivals for failure to offer them. If the mandatory rules turn out to be bad ones, investors can lose because it's prohibited to offer better devices. The national government, in other words, can win a race to the bottom in a way that states cannot. Winter said that Kerry was wrong to think that states are racing for the bottom. My addition today is that Kerry had things backward in thinking that the national government was superior to the states in corporate regulation. And we are moving toward a national system of corporate governance. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act, uh, on which I'll spend uh, much of my remaining time, is uh, fairly lengthy. And if I described more than a little of it, you would all have to skip lunch. So please excuse me for offering only a, a superficial and short description. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act does principally three kinds of things. First, it requires equal and fair disclosure of corporate information. 
I won't get into details, but the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, in combination with the SEC's regulation FD, FD stands for Fair Disclosure, forbids preferential disclosures of information to market analysts or, or in many other ways. The goal may have been to expedite disclosure, but I suspect that it does more to retard disclosure and make statements more generic. If you can't reveal in confidence some facts that may have these spillover effects for your rivals, you'll wait until the next authorized disclosure period, which in federal regulation is either yearly or quarterly, depending on what kind of disclosure we're talking about. There are benefits in speedier disclosure, but regulation FD makes it very hard to do. The second principal requirement of Sarbanes-Oxley is that traded corporations have independent boards. That is, boards of directors, a majority of whose members are independent of the issuer or anybody affiliated with the issuer. Each firm also has to have a committee uh, to choose an auditor and another to set executive compensation. And those committees have to be independent of the insiders. The idea is that insiders forced uh, to justify themselves to skeptical independence will be better servants of investors' interests. Well, that may or may not be so. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act sets up what might be understood as an adversarial model of corporate governance, more closely related to adjudication than to cooperative production. By forcing managers to justify themselves to these committees that are constituted as something like adjudicators, uh, one, one might get some benefit, but we're also losing some of the value of cooperation. And what do we get in exchange? Well, my suspicion, backed up some by data, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, is that independent directors should be relabeled as ignorant directors. Because independence means, it's almost defined to mean, that the people don't know what's going on. If you go to a firm and stay there full time, that is, spend enough time really to understand what's going on at this firm, you can no longer be classified as independent because you'll be a full time employee of the firm. Well, if you set up a set of people who are ignorant, they're much more easy to manipulate. And professors of all people should know that the best. Universities' boards of trustees are always completely independent, but they're also kept completely in the dark, and hence under the thumb of the president, dean, and faculty of the academic institution. Roberta Romano has written a wonderful article called The Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the Making of Quack Corporate Governance. Her point is that the Sarbanes-Oxley Act general governance prescriptions find little support in event studies of the kind that I described a while back. But my concern is that even if the studies did show benefits on average from independent boards and an adversarial model of governance, that would not be an adequate basis for suppressing competition in the design and implementation of governance devices. I want you to consider for a model four for, for a moment, four models of what the corporate board does. One is the Sarbanes-Oxley model in which outsiders choose and monitor the managers. The potential drawback is that less knowledge and poor incentives for the board uh, mean a lower quality of decision. You haven't got their interests aligned perfectly with investors. They don't know enough, don't know enough necessarily. And so you may get a very bad, bureaucracy-ridden outcome. Model number two is a generational competition model. The board includes the current managers and their underlings, who will be tomorrow's top dogs. Generation number two monitors generation number one closely to ensure that the corporation flourishes until they take over. Generation number two has pretty good information and incentives, and investors are incidental beneficiaries of the process. You can imagine generation number one and generation number two conspiring to exploit investors, but as a rule, generation number two doesn't want to be left holding the bag. Model number three depends on large block investors to do the monitoring. 
a surprisingly large number of corporations, even the biggest, uh, have investors or small groups of investors that own 10% or more of the stock. Harold Demsit showed that these large blocks are associated with better performance because the owners are good monitors. Now, it's true, many large firms lack those helpful monitors, and for them, independent boards may be better. But under Sarbanes-Oxley, the large block holders can't decide to dispense with the independent boards and take over themselves. That form of competition, that different model of corporate management uh, is precluded. It's blocked by law. Model number four is, of course, the market in corporate control. In that model, boards can be under manager's thumb, but outsiders are free to gather up the stock, displace the incumbents, and make a profit if, and only if, the firm was more valuable after the transformation than it was before. The takeover mechanism, which judges governance by results rather than by process, has fairly high transactions costs, and the national government is doing its best to make them higher, and I think that's regrettable. A meta-analysis of empirical work done recently by Lucian Bebchuk and others shows that what really helps investors is changes that promote the market for corporate control, rescinding poison pills, removing staggered boards, removing supermajority requirements, and so on. But the details of independence on the board matter not at all. Now, which of the four models is best for any given firm is impossible to say a priori. Different styles of governance may suit different firms, or the different styles of governance may suit the same firm at different times. Perhaps the independent monitoring model is best for most firms most of the time, but that doesn't justify the exclusion of other options when intelligent adults are willing to put their own money on the line. Vanilla ice cream is best for most people most of the time. It's far and away the most popular flavor. But no one thinks that society would be better off if all other flavors were forbidden by federal law. A reduction in the opportunity set makes everybody worse off all of the time. And yet that's fundamentally what the Sarbanes-Oxley Act has done to corporate governance. A third requirement of Sarbanes-Oxley is more monitoring by accountants, in addition to the monitoring by independent directors. Now, this takes several forms. The audit committee chooses the accountant. The accountant is forbidden to offer business consulting services on top of its auditing services because the combination is said to offer too great an incentive uh, for collusion. The accountant has to turn over its engagement leaders at least every five years, if not more frequently. Long tenure is said to lead to excess familiarity, so the cost of training replacements must be borne. Finally, each firm must establish an elaborate system of internal controls supervised by the accountant. When Congress asked the SEC to uh, estimate the cost of these controls, which were ultimately required by Section 404 of the Act, the SEC came up with the number $91,000 per firm per year. Now, that seemed like a small price to pay for better controls on theft. The actual experience, however, has been that Section 404 costs the economy more than $35 billion a year, about $7.8 million per reporting company, or about 30 times the SEC's estimate. Now, Ordinarily, you expect a government agency to be able to get things right within an order of magnitude, uh, but that was not so. People often say that in light of uh, Enron, WorldCom, and other scandals, something just had to be done, and uh, that Congress acted because Delaware had failed to do so. It's not clear to me that something had to be done. Fraud has been with us for a very long time, Neither OPM nor national student marketing or any of a hundred other frauds led to such legislation. If something really had to be done along the Sarbanes-Oxley lines, you would think it would lead to an improvement in stock prices. Run the event studies on the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, up prices would go. Well, the event studies were done and Sarbanes-Oxley depressed rather than increased stock prices. That is, the judgment of investors was that it made things worse rather than better. And why? Well, one of life's little ironies is that Enron was a model corporation by the standards of Sarbanes-Oxley. It had a majority independent board, 
It had an independent audit committee. It had an independent compensation committee. Its auditor was Arthur Anderson, not only held out as the gold standard of the industry at the time, but also the first to divest its consulting operations into what's now known as Accenture. The post-Enron discovery that uh, Arthur Anderson was a bad, indeed a criminal firm, is a fairy story. Uh, the Supreme Court, of course, reversed its criminal conviction. Uh, and Ted Eisenberg and John Macy found, after a painstaking empirical study, that Anderson had lower error rates in its work than the other major accounting firms. Nonetheless, the upshot of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act is that today, every public corporation must be governed just like Enron. One thing that went wrong at Enron is that the firm and its operations were so complex that people who weren't there full-time simply couldn't understand what was going on. And of course, in the criminal prosecutions that followed, even the people who were there full-time, indeed, even the CEO said it was too complex for him to understand. Uh, and I found that uh, a believable statement, whether or not the CEO committed other specific frauds. If you look at the people on the board who were there on the accounting committee, for example, one of the outsiders was Wendy Graham, an academic economist who had been chairman of the Commodities Futures uh, Trading Commission. Enron's audit committee included a former dean of the Stanford Business School. If these people could not grasp what Enron was doing with derivatives and special purpose entities, then what hope is there for the model of monitoring by independent and thus ignorant outsiders? Remember, too, that the Compensation Committee of the New York Stock Exchange, also a bunch of independents and a group of very sophisticated people, said after the fact that it just couldn't understand the complex compensation package that had been approved for Chairman Grasso and never would have approved it had they been able to comprehend it. Now, you're entitled to ask me if independence and other features of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act are problematic, how this legislation came to be. And to get a handle on an answer, we have to think public choice, that is, the economics of politics. States can't harm investors roughly for Judge Winter's reasons. If they make bad laws, incorporations and capital migrate elsewhere. Managers can't do much harm either. If they make mistakes in selecting governance rules, capital migrates elsewhere. Capital is highly mobile, right? So are governance structures, even when physical assets and labor are immobile. The internal affairs doctrine coupled with the Constitution's uh, Commerce Clause prevents states from discriminating against firms that are incorporated or have their headquarters elsewhere. But it's much harder to remove capital from the United States as a whole and this country does not recognize an internal affairs doctrine in its dealings with other nations. The fact that other firms are incorporated in Tokyo or Frankfurt is not viewed by the United States as an adequate reason to apply Japanese or German law. So if Congress makes a mistake, it's not undermined automatically the same way mistakes by state legislatures are undermined. Instead of saying that firms may incorporate in any country they choose, and that we will respect the corporate and securities laws of those nations, the United States insists that all firms that raise capital in the United States follow the domestic rules of the United States, even if they have their operations and principal sources of capital abroad. These days, the SEC is discussing having the United States adopt European accounting conventions, but it is not discussing having ongoing competition between the United, between our accounting conventions, their accounting conventions, and other particular accounting conventions. Everybody seems to agree that competition should not be allowed, but having negated the principal means by which interest groups' rent-seeking behavior is undercut, the United States has set itself up for exploitation of investors at the national level. Recall basic uh, model of Mansur Olson when talking about how interest groups succeed. Any interest group that wants favorable legislation is beset by free riding. Most group members stand on the sideline, and if everybody else does that, 
Why? The public interest may prevail. But small and concentrated groups may succeed where large ones fail. If you solve your free riding problem, if you can actually capture the benefits of legislation while others can't, then your political agenda flourishes. And the very best situation for interest group legislation is where the group seeking the benefits is very small and can capture those benefits efficiently, and the group paying the cost is large, that is, the people as a whole, because the loss to any one person may be small. It's, hard, it's very easy to see some of this in existing laws. Small groups from which dropping out is hard, dairy farmers, for example, get quite favorable legislation because the cost that that legislation, the cost that milk price supports impose is very widely spread. If people could trace the effects of this legislation, they might oppose it, but it's hard to trace. And of course, most people pay only a small amount because of each set of interest group laws, and they are therefore rationally ignorant. And you can't make this a good election issue. Most people won't want to vote on it because they know their votes can't outcome the can't affect the outcome of the election and so on. So you see over and over, if you just pick up any copy of the Journal of Law and Economics, you'll find an article or two or three or four explaining how this has worked with yet another bit of interest group legislation. So who are the interest groups in corporate law? Well, not the academy, surely. William Carey didn't accomplish much even when he was head of the SEC. Ralph Winter converted the academy on this subject, so professors of corporate and securities law today always are interested in markets and worry about the, the welfare of investors, but the professorate as a whole has no influence whatsoever on the politics of this issue. Ah, but the accounting profession and professional outside directors are something else again. The accounting profession is highly concentrated, and it's learned that it can get benefits at the national level. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act roughly doubled the amounts corporations pay for accounting services. Does it surprise you that after multiple scandals reveal that the accountants haven't caught the frauds and aren't doing very well for investors, Congress passes a law that requires you to spend twice as much money on accounting? Why buy twice as much of a good that has just been revealed to be low quality? But if you think in public choice terms, it should not surprise you that accounting failures become a means by which more resources are transferred from investors to accountants. And that as the number, there, there used to be a reference to the big 10 accounting firms, and then there were the big eight, then there were the big five, right? Now the big four and so on. That is the setup for interest group legislation. The smaller the group, the more the gains are concentrated, the better the solution to the free riding problem, and the more interest group legislation that you should expect to see. Now, I expect all of you at this point are, are saying in response, wait a minute, wait a minute. Back to Judge Winter's mechanism. Managers serve investors' interests. They're induced by competition to serve investors' interests. Thus, managers and corporations should be first in line to defeat proposals like the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And since everybody knows that big corporations are effective lobbyists, this should protect investors fully. Unfortunately, what everybody knows about the power of corporate lobbying is wrong. Consider question number one. If you suppose the interest group is corporations or investors, how do they solve their problem of free riding? People who could influence legislators if they tried need a good reason to try. If other persons similarly situated will do the job, any particular member of the group can sit on the sidelines, reaping the benefits without incurring the costs. As the group grows in size, free riding becomes first serious and then intractable. And there you have the problem for corporations. Corporations do very poorly in controlling free riding. Firms don't vote. They're forbidden by law from making direct political contributions. And so corporate influence really depends on the ability to energize and engage the interests of investors, those people who actually vote. But we're back to the fact that investors are large, scattered, and rationally ignorant when the time comes for an election. 
Corporations fare very poorly in handling uh, free riding. And if you doubt this, uh, you should ask yourself why there is an income tax. Right? There is an income tax which is levied on corporations with exemptions for small corporations like most other statutes have. Precisely because the costs are so diffuse and scattered so widely that people can't tell where it's born. And corporations have been unable to, uh, to, to feed these kinds of things. You would expect that only small, closely held corporations are likely to be politically effective. Uh, and as I've mentioned, they, they are. The Sarbanes-Oakley Act, for example, excludes really small corporations. So do most other federal statutes. They're a politically effective group in a way that large corporations are not. What then is to prevent a race for the bottom at the national level? Well, one answer lies in the special nature of this race. It's not being conducted by or for the benefit of corporate managers. The managers themselves remain in a competitive system. Before Sarbanes-Oxley and after Sarbanes-Oxley, managers' tenure at corporations has been falling. And managers at corporations that fail are doing worse and worse than they used to. There's wonderful empirical work on what happens to managers at corporations that get into business trouble. Uh, it used to be that those managers uh, could land reasonably well because it was fairly hard to say to separate bad luck from bad management. Uh, the increased information intensity that the internet and other features have brought us makes it easier to separate things, and so corporate managers do very poorly. The managers, therefore, continue to want good governance systems. Uh, the question is, to what extent are the constraints established by federal law make it impossible? Well, it doesn't make it impossible. One can opt out of the Sarbanes-Oxley system by, by going private. Although, of course, I have to come back to the beginning. That weakens the force of mandatory disclosure, the original goal of the federal securities laws. But firms have become much more adept at removing themselves from federal and increasingly state regulation. Just think about what's going on in the economy. Firms, it's not simply that private equity is taking more firms private. There are an increasing number of what Larry Ribstein calls uncorporations, LLCs, business trusts, other forms of getting a kind of organization that seems beneficial to investors uh, with lower visibility. And the ability of financial markets to support them has been increasing. Back when Burley and Means wrote, way back at the beginning, now 75 years ago when the, when the Securities Acts were enacted, the assumption was that most investments were made by individual investors. Even J.P. Morgan was an individual investor then. Uh, the investments were made by individual investors, and that's why you had to get thousands and tens of thousands of individual investors to underwrite a large firm. These days, most investments, more than 75% by the latest count, are made by financial intermediaries. They're made by mutual funds. They're made by pension funds. They're made by university endowments. And the university endowment can easily deal with institutions that are off the books. That is, they are LLCs. They are business trust, they are non-traded institutions. Taking the firm off the books no longer means lack of access to widely based financing. It may mean a reduced power of the mandatory disclosure obligation and therefore securities prices as a rule will be less informative, but there are answers uh, to Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, there is of course the fact that the United States is becoming smaller in relation to the world markets. And so, as I began this by, by telling you Ralph Winter's response to Kerry, the world may be supplying a response to Sarbanes-Oxley. That is, at the beginning, back in 1933, there was competition among states, and each state was relatively small compared to the whole financial market. Now we may be in a model of competition among nations, where each nation is relatively small in relation to the financial market. 
Now, that may mean, of course, that if bad corporate governance crops up in the United States, you would expect capital to flow to Germany or Japan or China. And it's not clear that that would be good for particular U.S. investors, but it might be fine uh, for the market as a whole. You should think about this in, con in the context of what happened recently in derivatives markets. It used to be, and I'm referring to publicly traded derivatives, not the kind of derivatives that AIG was, was issuing and which were not properly bound. They didn't have a properly balanced portfolio, let's say. Uh, but in public derivatives markets, everything is balanced. The Clearing Corporation holds absolutely balanced portfolios of these derivatives. There used to be a lot of regulation policed by the Commodities Futures Trading Commission in which people couldn't start trading derivatives in the United States without a huge and cumbersome bureaucratic process of getting things approved by the CFTC. It's largely gone away because people discovered that the main effect of that legislation was to drive people to trade in London and Frankfurt, which were essentially perfect substitutes for trading in Chicago. And so in the Commodities Futures Modernization Act of uh, 2000, which I think was a decent statute despite the fact that it's got modernization in its title and would cause anybody to wonder, that style of regulation was released and replaced with an information-based style of regulation. Where one had thought securities law began in 1933 and 1934, as the United States becomes relatively smaller in the global economy, one might expect to see more of that uh, in corporate law. Finally, I think, we should be thankful for small favors because some rent-seeking uh, sometimes gets its comeuppance at the national level. From any state's perspective, the fact that most investors live elsewhere creates some opportunity for exploitation. We've seen that, for example, in tort law where state court A will impose a large damages award against drug manufacturer B, and all the money comes into the state, but the cost is borne out of state because most of the shareholders in drug company B live out of state. Well, you could imagine that kind of thing happening in corporate law, and in the 1990s it was really beginning to happen in securities law. Uh, legislation passed in 19... 95, 1996, and 1988 made that uh, much more difficult. And so it made competition at the state level uh, effectively better. One hopes that you'll see more of that at the national level. But for, in for the interest group reasons I have given, I tend to doubt it. I think we can expect international competition, however, uh, to be much more powerful. So let me close where I began. Ralph Winter's great article of 1977 brought light to a dark corner of the law and set the stage for scholarship in the next generation. We have to carry on that worthy tradition by asking whether federal regulation now creates the very problem that Chairman Kerry feared from the states. Thank you very much. <laughs>